What is flocking? Basically, it's a group of animals, or humans, or robots. It really doesn't matter. In certain contexts, we call this group a flock. Basically, this video is a tutorial on how to simulate a flock of things. Just things. Now, flocking steering behavior is not a concept native to only Roblox Luo. It's a technique that can be used across all coding environments and game development IDEs like Unreal and Godot and Game Maker and Unity and but I'm gonna use Roblox Studio because that is the only program that my pathetic ass understands. So to get started, I create a new base plate and immediately insert an NPC. I'm gonna call him a boy. Nope, and don't worry, that that's not a slur or anything. He's called a boy because that's exactly what he's going to be. That's right. We are creating life. Well, the more accurate way of saying it would be we're just simulating it. But whatever. I then made sure he had server-side animations before inserting another script. Now this is where the cooking begins. First, we need to allow Boyd and the flock to find each other in the game directory. So I'm putting them in this flock folder. Now you could use tags and collection service to group them together instead but um, yeah that's for nerds and I'm not a nerd. Now the actual reason is I personally like this approach better myself so I'm using it. Then I duplicated my boy Boyd here a few more times because bro is not a one man army and you can't reasonably call this a flock. In the script, let's connect a run service post simulation event function so that the boy will calculate where it's supposed to go every frame. Then we'll use. Wait, what the. What is that? This, my friends, is humanoid move. Now, I know most of you mainly use humanoid move to instead because most of the time you know the position you want your NPC to go to and you just plug it in there. But in flock simulations, the NPCs or the boys' movement will be dictated by a bunch of direction forces instead of knowing exactly where to go. And guess what function uses direction? That's right, humanoid move. So yeah, this function will make things very convenient. Now I mentioned before about a bunch of direction forces, but what does that mean? Well, it turns out flock behavior can easily be summarized by three behavior forces. What simple creatures we are. These forces are separation, cohesion, and alignment. To explain these three forces, I want you to imagine you're at a marching band, which kind of means you're in a flock now. Now, you don't want to get too close to the other band members because you guys might hurt each other while playing your instruments or whatever. And also because both of you like your personal space. That's what separation is. But then out of nowhere, you get separated from the group too much. And now you just look like a dork standing all by yourself. Naturally, you would want to reconnect with that group. So. That's what cohesion is. Now alignment is simple. You just want to be facing the same direction with the rest of the group because you look out of place if that's not the case. <laughs> Who's the fucking smartest over there? <laughs> so to continue with the script, I will add these three forces as variables. The basic idea is when we add them all together at the end inside this humanoid move function, the boy will move in the most optimal direction which satisfies all three of these behavior forces for that specific frame. Now what I'm going to do next is immediately remove the alignment force variable because it turns out humanoids have this thing called auto rotate which automatically turns them in the direction they're moving. And since our boys will later try and go to roughly about the same area, they will automatically align anyways. 
Now it's time to calculate this separation force. And it actually borrows a lot of logic from the marching band analogy I used earlier. If you're too close to another flock member, you want to move away from them. And you take into consideration how close you are to all of the other members. Naturally, of course, you only want to get away from members really close to you, while members further away are basically non-existent. So we'll make an inverse of the distance between each member. Basically, that's just a higher number, the lower the distance is. It's not that complicated. And scale it with the unit vector pointing from the other member to you. This piece of code basically says, if you're closer to me and within this range, I'll have a higher desire to move away from you in that final calculation down here. Since this code looks kinda sketchy, I wanna print out the separation force and run the game because my code has a 99% fail rate. Wow, what a surprise. Turns out my flock folder variable wasn't really referencing the flock folder. Programming 101, am I right guys? <laughs> Now we can see the separation force, but to really see it as intended, I'll plug it into the humanoid move for now. And it works! This boy is the only one with the script, and it's trying to desperately get away from other boys whenever they get close, just like how I avoid the people I love in real life. <coughs> Anyways, let's move on with... To add cohesion behavior, we need to make him face towards the flock, then walk in that direction. Or in simpler terms, walk to the flock. But how do you determine where the flock is? That is also actually pretty simple. We'll use averages. And kids, this is why you fucking pay attention to math class. Every day I have to hear some new middle schooler fucking whine about Oh, I'm never gonna use this in the future. But you are! You are gonna use it in the future! You stupid- So basically, cohesion is to make the boy go towards the average position of the flock. But how do we calculate that? Well, I'm going to explain to you. Don't blame me if you miss it. First, we add up the position of every boy in the flock, then we just divide that by the total number of boys. Yep, that's it. Th that, that's it. Actually, it's kind of like how you calculate the mean average of a bunch of numbers. You add them up and you divide it by the amount of numbers. In this case, we substitute the numbers for positions. You can also plot this concept out on the graph and see it work in real time for yourself, if that's what you like. So inside our code, we'll do just that. Let's add up everyone's position in this average pos variable, then divide it by the number of voids at the end here. Now we just make a unit direction that points from the void to the average position like this, and yeah, that's the cohesion force. I'll also put a multiplier to make it stronger because from past experimentation, the cohesion force gets completely overwhelmed by the separation force sometimes. So I found that times 3 is a good multiplier. Add that baby in and BOOM! Oh, oh they're not moving. Um, oh, uh, I know why. Let me just add this script to the rest of the little guys and now they are a working flock. Yay! They sort of just vibrate slowly towards 0, 0, 0. I, I don't know why but yeah. I think the thing you should pay attention to however is that they are staying together while also staying an appropriate distance apart, so uh, it, it works. <laughs> Although we have a flock now, the flock is still kind of, how do I say this? Aimless? Purposeless? Pointless? What I'm trying to say is, they have no goal, no drive to go anywhere. Yeah, they're acting as a flock, but they don't really want to go anywhere. They just kind of vibrate. Okay, that sounds weird. So how do we get them to move somewhere, anywhere? First, I added an attribute into the flock folder that the boys are in and named it 
target pause with a vector tree type. I think you can see where this is going. Basically, we're going to add another force to the equation, our own force, called goal force. This adds a tendency into their behavior where they also want to collectively move to a certain position. And this is as easy as you expect it to be. This force is just a simple unit direction pointing from themselves to the target position specified by the attribute. Pretty simple. Okay, as I expected, the goal force is not that dominant. So we'll have to add a multiplier to that as well. Now, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, I mean, that should be the end of the video, but a lot of things are still missing. For example, why are they spazzing out like that? And also, they're really stupid because herder, no pathfinding. So they don't have any concept of obstacle avoidance. So how do we add all that? Now, I don't want this video to be too long and complicated. So I won't add pathfinding stuff in this video to their logic. But what I will do is try and fix this epilepsy bullshit they're doing. So next, I put this post simulation code all in one module script, which I can then call a function inside of to essentially assign flock steering behavior to the boys. So, you know, I don't have to manually alter every script every time I need to make a change to the code. Now, let's get to the bottom of this. Why do they keep going back and forth like idiots? Well, to understand why, we need to analyze the humanoid move function a little closer. You see, the higher the magnitude of the vector tree plugged into the function, the faster the MPC will move. The magnitude of a vector is basically how long it is. If you still don't know what that means, then I suggest you learn vector math all over again. Uh, because I won't be explaining what vectors are in this video. You're just gonna have to restart, buddy. So, big number means big fast. But that is only true until the magnitude of the vector used is 1. If it's higher than 1, the humanoid walks normally at its assigned walk speed. Now look back at our code. The reason why our boys do such sudden back and forths is because the value here is always really high. Now what do I mean? Let's look at this clip. Okay, now let's slow it down. You see, our boy here is only being affected by cohesion. Everything's fine, right? But the instant that the separation force kicks in, boom. It not only completely nullifies the cohesion force, but also overpowers it, and it switches the direction rapidly. And the magnitude of the final force between this frame and this frame is nowhere near 1. Even though now the vector is in another direction, it kind of just jumps to another big number really fast. So, in order to fix the seizure movement thing, the boys are doing, we need to keep these values in check. Actually, what we really need to do is apply multiple checks or filters until the final result in here makes their movement look smooth. First, let's put all of this in a variable called final force to simplify things a little bit. Now, after I did that, I actually went behind the scenes and cut out all of the experimenting and trials and errors and I finally ended up with these four adjustments, which resulted in this smoother movement. I will now explain the reason behind why I added each check. This line basically removes the y value out of the final force because um, we are, in, we are on a flat plane <laughs> and I don't want this y-axis force to potentially affect our calculations in any way since, you know, you know we're not needing it. Alright, that's one line. Now, the next line might seem a little confusing, but like many things in this video, it's not if you're smart. If you multiply a vector's unit by its magnitude, you get the original vector. Because like, the unit of a vector is just the vector, but without its magnitude, 
basically its magnitude will be one. So when you multiply the unit by the magnitude, you just get back the original vector. This line of code ensures that the final force's magnitude is under one. Because like I explained before, sudden huge changes in magnitudes plugged into the move function makes the MPC spin around really fast. And we don't really want that. I also can't simply set it to its unit like this because it always changes the magnitude to one even when the original magnitude is below one, which I want to potentially accept. Now on to the next line, which is our dampening check. Spoilers, it dampens the force. All right, I know that doesn't explain a lot. So dampening in this context is basically taking the last frame's final force and then setting this frame's final force to something in between that. For example, if the last frame's final force is this and this frame's final force is this, I don't want an NPC to suddenly use this to move because it would cause a jerking motion, which just makes them look like a traumatized war veteran. So to smooth out the movement between the last frame and this frame, I use lerp here to interpolate between the two values. Then after all that, we can record this frame's final force into this variable so it can be used for the next frame. For our fourth and final check, I just turn off the NPC's auto-rotate if they virtually aren't moving at all because despite my best efforts, even one tiny ass change in the vector's direction will cause them to spin. Hey, 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 blame how the humanoids work, not me. And with all of this stuff out of the way, we have this as our final result. Yeah, so that's the end of the video. I know the boys still lack more advanced features like pathfinding. Like is this crowd of boys supposed to know this is a wall? But I feel like this video is more about the fundamentals than anything. So yeah, now you can make your own simple brain vlogs in Roblox Studio. Go ahead. Alright, remember to like and subscribe and I'll see you in 300 years.